The topic of death accompanies people since the time when there was no electricity or the internet. There wasn't even coffee in Starbucks yet, and people already wanted to know what was there, how much money to take there with them, and what kind of jewelry to wear before death to look good in that world. Earlier and even now, this natural process has caused us not very positive emotions. No one even knows what awaits them next, heaven or hell. But today, everything has changed. When humanity conquers space, and we, gamers, conquer the Ice Throne together, and the whole raid dies on the last 100 health marks of the Lich King, we meet death in games every day. Then what does this death mean to us? Today, we'll understand how such a seemingly simple and ordinary game mechanic, one might even say as natural as death, gave birth to an incredible variety of genres and unique plots in the game industry. And the most interesting thing is that maybe this is why we love games so much, because they give us a second chance. You're watching Press X. Get comfortable and be ready to face death. Oh, we mean, uh, enjoy. At the beginning of the game industry, when games were still stored on cartridges and arcade machines stood in gaming cafes, the main task of game creators was to keep the player in front of the monitor for as long as possible. And in games like Pac-Man, Snake, or even Tetris, the mechanics of death were very simple and primitive. After you've been overtaken by a colored ghost or carelessly hit your own tail, your screen would light up with the all-knowing game over phrase, and your score would be recorded and set as your high score. But it was start from the beginning that pushed every self-respecting player to break his own record. And if someone has a record higher than yours, it's a total disaster. Children, teenagers, and adults stayed up at night to collect as many freaking dots as possible in the maze to carry the honorary title of Pac-Man King. Just so you know, the highest score with no deaths is 3,336,360 points. Yep. It's 3,330,360 points, and it was done by this crazy gamer, William James Mitchell, better known as Billy Mitchell, who is known for his streak of records in arcade games. But this is another story, which we'll tell another time. Apparently, death as an obstacle has become the basic and fundamental mechanic of death in games. What does it mean? Let's go back to September 1985, when the first game, Super Mario Bros., was released. Here, the oldies faced a new and absolutely specific goal of the game. Instead of stupidly collecting dots on the monitor and bragging at school, now you and your mustachioed Italian brother Mario, like real plumbing knights, have to go to the Mushroom Kingdom, probably not the kingdom you thought of, beat up Bowser with your lacquered boots, and save Princess Peach. And so, that everything does not seem so simple to the player, and he is forever chained to the NES, Shigeru Miyamoto, the legendary Japanese game designer who gave birth to the entire modern game industry, and is the father of such masterpieces as Donkey Kong, The Legend of Zelda, and of course, Mario himself, invented hearts and levels system. Now you have a chance to shoot at enemies a certain number of points, and get additional health to save yourself from the unfortunate phrase, Game Over. And if death does come to our mustachioed friend Mario, then the player will not have to start the whole game from the beginning, as it was in the games of the past. All of Mario's mechanics are built around levels, and completing those levels without dying. Therefore, having lost all hearts, the player is returned to the beginning of the level at which one has been, keeping the past progress, and can try to pass it again. The game increases the complexity of enemies, tasks, and the speed with each past stage. In general, this death mechanic became the basis for almost all early platformers. Commander King, Crash Bandicoot, Prince of Persia in 1989. Later in the next generation of games, the most popular option of autosave appeared, and the developer of the role-playing game Undertale and part-time composer Toby Fox even found an interesting explanation for the ability to load the game from the last save, the ability of the main character called Determination. That is, the power that allows the soul to continue to exist after death. Save points in Undertale are located throughout the dungeon and are an expression of the protagonist's determination, restore health, and also reflect his thoughts. 
According to game designer Toby Fox, determination is characteristic of all creatures by nature in a small amount, and if a soulless creature gets enough determination, it can feel the will to live. Almost like life. With each new project, the game developers use the loading after death mechanic as a base. Either they came up with something new and original, adapting to new genres, or they broke all standards of game mechanics and built works of art on the basis of death. So let's try to consider all possible death mechanics in modern games, even those you did not know yet. First of all, it's worth considering projects in which death is the basis from which everything began and on which everything has been tied. Of course, we're talking about games of the roguelike genre which were formed back in 1980 with the release of the computer game Rogue, which is considered the beginning of the subgenre of role-playing video games. Roguelike games feature random, procedural level generation, turn-based gameplay, and of course, permanent character death if defeated. That is, after losing once, the player's character dies forever as in real life, losing the entire gameplay and all the achievements. The creators of Rogue were Michael Toy and Glenn Witchman, who developed the game for the Unix operating system. Despite the rather primitive tiled graphics in the form of white symbols on a black background, the game became popular, and this approach to graphic design has long been fixed in history as a feature of the genre. Rogue begins at the very top level of an undefined dungeon with countless monsters and treasures. The player performs the typical role of an adventurer of early fantasy role-playing games. After all, his goal is to break through to the lower level, get the Amulet of Yendor, and come back to the surface. At the same time, it becomes more and more difficult to defeat monsters with each level, and until the amulet is received, the player cannot return to previous levels. Each dungeon level consists of a three-room by three-room grid, potentially, but sometimes dead-end corridors and monsters appear where the player might expect a room. Thus, death and rogue becomes very possible. Gradually, the genre began to develop, and over time, random generation of not only dungeons and worlds, but in general, everything, appeared in roguelike games. Random procedural generation allowed the developers to constantly give the player something new. Thus, when the player encountered completely new conditions, after dying in the same location, procedural generation only increased the possibility of permanent death. Some genre representatives, on the contrary, began to exclude the character's permanent death from the list of main features. In general, it's interesting how humanity evolved from this to the immersive sim genre, but it's already been discussed in a separate video which you can also watch on our channel. Let's return to roguelikes. So dying in a roguelike almost always had a big impact on the game. Dying, the player lost game experience, armor, skills, basically everything, and had to start over. He went through the game again, like the first time, but this time he already had his own experience, and despite the random levels generation, he roughly understood what was ahead of him, from existing monsters to possible item bonuses. But really, what does almost always mean? The thing is that with the genre development, more modern roguelikes make a small concession to the player and do not kill their character completely, thereby sending them to the beginning of the game. And for example, they leave the character certain resources, weapons, or the acquired level together with skills or money to buy equipment. That is, the player goes back, but only partially. You'll say, but this is not considered death. It should be a different genre altogether because the developers give the player a second chance and make it easier to pass. And you will be right. So rogue-like transformed into rogue light. and it is the latter that is the more popular and successful subgenre of today. Of course, among roguelike games, there are cult classic ones such as The Binding of Isaac, inspired by The Legend of Zelda, which was released in 2011 by independent developers Edmund McMillan and Florian Himsel. You can even say that it was this game that influenced the development of this genre. 
But recently, more and more developers are listening to players and making life easier for them in their digital world. A good example of this is the recent Hades and Dead Cells. Speaking of Dead Cells, the inspiration for the French developers from Motion Twin and Evil Empire were games like Team Fortress 2, the Dark Souls series, and the already mentioned The Binding of Isaac. This is an interesting collection. According to the plot, the player controls an amorphous creature capable of inhabiting dead bodies located in the depths of the island. The name of the lead character is The Beheaded, and his main goal is to escape from the island and later kill the king of this island. By exploring procedurally generated levels, the player obtains weapons, treasures, and everything else that helps fight against powerful mutated opponents. If a character controlled by the player loses all health points, then all items obtained during the exploration of locations will be lost. However, after death, the game is not over, because the head of the beheaded, that is the consciousness that belongs to the player, is immortal. Only the bodies possessed by the beheaded are mortal. In this way, a character's death will cause the head to return to the beheaded's cabin to find another corpse. It's an interesting explanation invented by French developers, isn't it? In the same period of time, in 2018, the American studio Supergiant Games was developing a game in the roguelike genre with a combination of action RPG, Hades. Initially, the project was released in Early Access as an exclusive for the then-launched Epic Games Store service, a competitor of Steam from Valve. And already in 2020, the full game version was released for Microsoft Windows, Mac OS, and Nintendo Switch, where most connoisseurs of the roguelike genre got to know it. The game plot is based on ancient Greek mythology. The main character Zagreus, the son of Hades, lord of the underworld, tries to escape from this underground kingdom and reach Mount Olympus, and on his way, Zagreus is helped by the Olympian gods who send him various gifts. Already by this storyline, the developers invented an interesting explanation for the deadly danger surrounding the player and the random generation of resources in procedurally generated rooms with enemies. The game features four environments, the so-called sections of the realm of the dead, in each of which the player faces new enemies and dangers. Tartarus, Asvidel, Elysium, and the Temple of Styx. At the same time, if Zagreus's health drops to zero, he will die. And in case of death, Zagreus will be returned to the Palace of Hades to the very beginning of the journey. The only thing that can save the player from death is the ability to spend the treasures collected during the passage to improve the characteristics or unlock new types of weapons. The main thing to remember is that in case of the hero's death, all the gifts of the Olympians received by the player in the last playthrough will be lost. The latest example of such an approach in roguelike games can be called Returnal, which was released in 2021 by the Finnish studio Housemark for the PlayStation 5 console and in February 2023, it was released for Windows. The story of Returnal revolves around an astronaut named Selene Vasos, who traveled to the planet Atropos in search of the mysterious white shadow signal. Something causes serious damage to the ship, so Selene is forced to make an emergency landing on the planet, but exploring the planet's surface, she finds many of her own corpses. You were how I escape. Selene then realizes that when she dies, it takes her back to when her ship crashed. Now she must find out what caused the time loop and why she's stuck in it in the first place. And again, you can appreciate what an interesting plot explanation the developers came up with to implement the mechanics of the character's constant rebirth after death. The player must make their way through an unfamiliar planet, dodging bullets and destroying enemies. Simultaneously, the player gets access to a variety of weapons, from pistols and assault rifles to more futuristic ones, which can be improved with various characteristics. But when the player dies, and they will surely die, they return to the beginning of their run. And the main thing is that the game consists of two parts, and the only control point to save progress in the game is somewhere halfway. So, in any case, the player will have to run and dodge enemies a lot, unless, of course, they want to die. Apparently, it is death that gives Returnal, Hades, and other games in the roguelike genre unique replayability. Without death, 
The player will not be able to go through the path of self-improvement and gain invaluable personal experience of navigating the game world. Just as in reality, without death, we would not be able to appreciate what our life is worth. So in virtual reality, death encourages us to develop. That is why death, in roguelike games, is an integral basis on which life is built. But it is not always necessary for the player to die in order to end the game. Some games, on the contrary, severely punish it. Therefore, from games that are based on death, we will move to a rather popular death mechanic, which can be called death as a fine. One of the simple and very effective mechanics, which in the era of cooperative online games, is used by most representatives of the MOBA genre. There are such games as Dota 2, League of Legends, HOTS, Hero of the Storm, if anyone still remembers what they are. And generally, this is very logical because the essence of a team game is embedded in all these games. Yes, it's a team game. You can look it up in Wikipedia. Probably even now, some streamer is shouting somewhere like, in solo, or some Dota analyst is mocking that the team was forgotten as soon as Dota came out. But one cannot deny the fact that the mechanics are built on this very thing. And in this case, death acts as a fine. It's in the form of a certain timeout of the game for your mistakes in the gameplay, or for your carelessness. And at the same moment for the opponent's death, you receive a reward, which basically is also a standard for maintaining and balancing the match economy. That's why some of the smartest players would just go around and die on purpose, powering up their opponents in the process, for the sake of... <laughs> We think it's better not to consider this issue. But unlike League of Legends and HOTS, Dota has a unique mechanic of redeeming yourself from the tavern, which in general can also sometimes be used not for victory. However, not only MOBA games can penalize the player for death. For example, in the series of action RPG games Fable from Lionhead Studios, the main character is controlled from the third person, and therefore the main game feature, the personalization of the player's character, is very present. Almost everything a player does affects their character to some extent. In the game, you can do virtually everything. Fight, work, and just live in your own home. But the game can penalize the player for all bad deeds. Excessive eating of meat or apple pies leads to obesity. Excessive drinking leads to seasickness and nausea. And for murders in Fable 2, the player's aura can change in general, from so good that a halo flies over the character to absolutely devilishly evil. But the most important thing is that from receiving damage in battle and death, the character has scars, which then cannot be removed in any way, except to start the game from the beginning. Consider another basic death as fine mechanic that is typical of multiplayer online role-playing games. For this, we'll return to the father of modern Dota 2, World of Warcraft. The game which according to the Guinness Book of Records is the most popular MMORPG in the world and the number of game subscribers is more than 12 million players. Needless to say about the amount of content in the game, starting from the variety of characters, classes, races that have become canonical in the world of computer games, ending with a great number of dungeons, boss mechanics, leveling systems, professions, and mounts, we think this list will never end. And the most important thing is lore. While players have already experienced eight expansions, starting from the classic World of Warcraft, then the fight with the Burning Legion, the battle on top of the Ice Throne with the Lich King, which was probably the most favorite expansion among fans of the history of WoW, which was released back in 2008, and ending with the latest expansion, Dragonflight, which was released in 2022. Since the game features two game systems, PvE, player versus environment, and PvP, player versus player, we will still consider PvE to understand the mechanics of death. So how does WoW make us value every life, even if death is not the end? World of Warcraft mostly appeals with cooperative gameplay, and at the very beginning presents the player with a choice in what will be your role in this game, or even in this micro-society. And accordingly, by choosing a tank, healer, or damage dealer, you sign a contract to perform certain actions to a certain extent. If you ignore them, you actually put all your companions and even fellow guild members at risk of death. And you must consider that WoW has one of the largest dungeon systems with elite enemies and legendary bosses for 20 or 40 people. Basically, they are the main source of things and artifacts for pumping your character, so passing them is the most valuable. 
In practice, if your tank, which is holding an army of mobs, dies because some cleric, priest, or paladin pressed the wrong button and healed some rogue, your tank dies. Basically, there's nothing left for the entire raid except to humbly become an AFC and wait until this army of mobs sends them to the nearest cemetery. Ready, guys? Let's do this. Leroy Let's not miss the mechanics of the Second Life, which are present in some individual classes, such as the Warlock, and also the ability to resurrect players right on the battlefield like a priest. So after death, you leave your mortal body, and it, the body, remains in the same place where you die, after which you are teleported to the nearest graveyard in the form of a spirit, where you are presented with a choice. Either run god knows where to your corpse and find yourself back in the vortex of events and an army of mobs, or talk to the angel to resurrect you right here and you will be fined for 10 minutes of real time. But the latter will always put a curse on you and lower your stats. Not only that, after each death the strength of your equipment will drop and you'll have to spend gold to repair it, because a completely broken thing will not give you its stats. And at high levels, this repair is very expensive. Therefore, death in this case is not a very profitable thing. Especially when you spend an hour getting to some boss and realize that someone doesn't know the game mechanics and kills the entire raid just because they went to the wrong place. And the only thing left for you is to come to terms with the fact that you will not go further and start living with the idea that lost time is the biggest fine in computer games. We will move from multiplayer online games to genre-based single-player games, where developers have more freedom for mechanics and players manage their own time. Next, we will consider the most famous life simulator, Sims. Basically, the name of the genre speaks for itself, Life Simulator, where the player acts as God in the Sims' lives. And that's probably why Sims is quite a popular game, because who wouldn't want to try themselves in the role of God? It is a very interesting and at the same time scary fact that the Sims game designer Will Wright, the father and developer of the entire Sims series and co-founder of the studio Maxis, which produces games of this series, is an atheist by faith. And the idea of The Sims came to him when in 1991 he watched his house burn. The fire was consuming everything that was so close to him and he watched it indifferently. But that's another story. If you're interested in the history of the world's most popular life simulator, let us know in the comments, and we'll make a separate video about The Sims. Simulating real life, the game focuses on Sims, characters that, like real people, only live in Sim City. They even have their own language, Simlish, which imitates real Italian, Czech, Dutch, and Japanese languages. And they have their own currency, Simoleon. Basically, this is all that people need for existence, and considering that Sims have their own personal needs, feelings, and goals, Sims gives a lot of freedom in managing them to the player. In the game settings, you can even enable freedom of will for your Sims. However, even with freedom of will enabled, Sims will not be able to find jobs, pay bills, and have children on their own, because all this is the will of the player. But what Sims do very well is dying. Sometimes it reaches the point of absurdity. In The Sims, you can die from almost anything. A fire, a lightning strike, drowning in a pool, or even from grief. Some kind of miracle has to happen for a Sim to live and die of old age. By the way, the problem of death in pools existed in Sims until the fourth part of the game because Sims could not get out of there if there were no stairs. And all this happened without the player's intervention. But of course, everyone gets tired of watching the Sims' everyday life, arranging a comfortable and bright future for them, so players sometimes start to show their sadistic tendencies, of course, within the game. And who would refuse God's power? Therefore, from this moment on, the Sim's life ceases to be bright. The player can close the Sim in a constructed room without a door and wait until they die of hunger or dehydration. Or take them out into the cold and wait until they freeze. Or lead them to the Langathilus simnivori, also known as the cow plant, which is basically a mix of the plant from Plants vs. Zombies and a cow that will just spit you out the first time and eat you the second time without leaving a bone. You can even make your sims die of laughter or embarrassment. Of course, it's not very easy to do, but it is possible. Therefore, the fact that the character of death is also present in sims will not surprise you. 
we think. His name is the Grim Reaper. His persona sends us to Terry Pratchett's book series Flat World. The Grim Reaper, accompanied by terrifying music, comes to the dying Sim as if to work and takes them with him. And if a character dies of old age with a full scale of success, death can even pay him respect. In The Sims Live and Large and The Sims 2, the player could even negotiate with death so that the Sim would not be taken away. Or if death is in a bad mood, he can turn a Sim into a zombie. So death in The Sims is not something special. Just like in our lives, death is an integral part of our lives. However, Will Wright, together with Electronic Arts, offers us to play with it, which is unlikely to be done by a person in real life. From playing a so-called god, where you are both life and death, we will move on to the well-known evolutionary process, where death, although it is an inevitable condition, gives the player a push to develop. The first game to understand the mechanics of death as a test will be the 2020 survival simulator Ancestors The Humankind Odyssey from Panache Digital Games, where the player faces the fate of a primitive primate. Panache Digital Games was founded in 2014 by game director Patrice Desilets after he left Ubisoft. Desilets directed Ancestors The Humankind Odyssey and focused on creating a toolkit for his new game that allowed characters to interact intensively with the environment. The team intended to set the game in a prehistoric era so that they didn't have to build huge cities for players to explore. According to Desilet, he was bored with 10,000 BC, so he decided to create a game set from 10 million years ago. And he succeeded, because all the benefits of a civilized computer game are absent in Ancestors The Humankind Odyssey. There's no tutorial here to help the player in any way, other than outlining some mechanics, making you adapt and learn from your mistakes just like our ancestors did in a world filled with mortal danger. The survival simulator forces players to use their own instincts to find food, sniff out enemies, or use their hearing to distinguish the variety of sounds that are present in the game. I'm listening for sound right now. Uh, there is that. You must focus. <laughs> The player must decide for themselves whether it's danger or not. There's not even a minimap here, in order not to limit the player's freedom of choice, especially since the game was developed on Unreal Engine 4 and uses arbitrary generation elements of parts of the landscape. Exploring New Horizons is complicated by the fact that when a primate explores new places or is hunted by predators, it enters a state of fear. The faces of wild hyenas begin to appear all over the screen, which can be defeated by finding glowing orbs of light or it will fall into a state of hysteria. Humankind Odyssey is beginning to resemble a childhood simulator, especially when you were taught to swim by just being thrown into the water and you're floundering in it and trying to survive. The main goal of the player is to ensure the survival of their clan, the same primitive monkeys to evolve into a more advanced species. Thanks to that, we were born in a time where there was light and the internet. And you, as the person responsible for this clan, must control the state of health, the level of thirst, hunger, and sleep and the most important thing is to make sure that all members of your clan survive. You can learn different skills to do this while your primate sleeps. For example, you can learn how to make a bed, or how to make medicine from plants, or you can go to a new link of evolution so that your primate can use two hands or stand upright. You can even reproduce, and your skills will be passed on to the next generation. But somehow it all sounds very rosy. In practice, you'll suffer from giant African crocodiles, deadly hugs with pythons, fight off hyenas and pray that at least one of your tribe members survives. And if you lose all your fellow tribesmen, the game will end and you'll have to start all over again. So if you want to test yourself in the fight against death, then Ancestors The Humankind Odyssey will open this door for you, if you're really ready for it. From the real world of nature and evolution, we move into the world of dark fantasy. Probably only babies haven't heard of the Dark Souls series yet. If you tell someone that you're going to install one of the parts of this game, then everyone around you begins to tenderly sympathize with you and want to save even a drop of nerve cells. 
If you say that you've already installed one of the parts, then your grandmother will begin to give you her stash of sedatives. The mother will wipe away her tears with a white handkerchief and wave you a goodbye, and the father will salute, knowing that his son or daughter will have an incredibly difficult journey ahead of them. Therefore, the fact is that Dark Souls has become a new ritual of growing up for every gamer. A trial by death. We think no one will deny it. Oh... Uh... Yes... Yes... No... 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 <laughs> You're right there... <laughs> Moreover, the greatness of this game is confirmed by GameSpot, which has quite a reputation in the gaming world, and the award for Best Gaming Website in 2004. It is in their opinion that Dark Souls is the most influential video game of the century, setting trends for such games as Skyrim, The Witcher 2, Deus Ex Human Revolution, Batman Arkham City, Uncharted 3, Portal 2, and Modern Warfare 3. How did Japanese game design genius Hidetaka Miyazaki, who gave us a whole universe of dark fantasy from 2009's Armored Core and Demon's Souls to 2022's Elden Ring, managed to create his own game production company, From Software. And what does death have to do with it? In addition to the incredible game plot, which is based on ancient Greek, Scandinavian, and Japanese mythology, in which death plays a very important role in the world structure, the main character of Dark Souls is a dead man who walks around the world and collects fragments of humanity to become alive again. But let's not go into the details of the Dark Souls world lore. We can talk about it for hours separately. But let's focus on the main mechanics, because you can look endlessly at three things in life. How fire burns, how water flows, and how people die again and again in Dark Souls. This dark world does not forgive the player's mistakes. It makes you study the mechanics of enemies and bosses more and more with each new death. This game tests not the character, but the player for their dexterity, reaction, and memory. It tests the strength of spirit and tolerance because only few of the players have never broken their keyboard or thrown the mouse against the wall after 40 deaths on the same boss. It is the game complexity that conquered players all over the world. The Dark Souls series has become a certain Everest for a game climber, and when a person faces such a challenge, everyone wants to pass it. The soul accumulation system plays a particularly important role in the game mechanics. After all, this is the most valuable resource of the entire game, thanks to which you can pump up your hero and increase his health and agility indicators, which are very important when fighting a boss. Therefore, the game makes you protect these souls like the apple of an eye, because when you die, the player loses them. If the souls fall out, there's only one chance to get them back, to get back to the point of death. Because if the player accidentally slips on a pebble on the way and dies a second time, he can say goodbye to his souls as well as his nervous system. The worst thing is that after each death, all the enemies that you took so long and painstakingly to kill that you hated for two hours while trying to get to the location with the boss are resurrected, and you have to spend two hours of your life fighting again. On top of that, in Dark Souls 2, the player received a health penalty for each death, and it became less and less each time after death until the hero ate the necessary item, Human Effigy, to restore it. However, it's not that bad because the world of Dark Souls is scattered with bonfires, checkpoints that have become a certain hallmark of this game. This is the only bright spot in this dark world. Therefore, in order to save your life and regain your strength, it's better to sit down next to it and rest, and the time you save from reckless deaths will be your greatest reward. If you still manage to overcome the world of Dark Souls and think that there's nothing more to surprise you, then the company From Software and Hidetaka Miyazaki will not leave you without this satisfaction. We think that this crazy Japanese man has an innate drop of sadism. In addition to all the problems that arise after death in the Dark Souls series, in Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, which was released in 2019, players have to deal with additional circumstances. This time, your death affects not only your game leveling and loss of game currency, but also the game plot itself. Because with each of your deaths, the NPCs who meet you on the way begin to suffer from the Dragon Plague some mysterious disease that affects active characters and merchants with a strong cough. This blocks dialogues and quests with them, but does not affect other possibilities of interaction if they are present. For example, trading. Besides the fact that the more characters will be sick, the less chance there will be of invisible help, which makes it impossible for you to level up and further progress through the game's story. 
The worst thing is that these NPCs also play the role of Dark Souls bonfires, and the NPC, being sick, will not be able to ensure your sins, i.e. in-game money. And of course, we forgot, this is not the worst thing. If the number of NPCs' deaths and diseases exceeds a certain indicator, then they will eventually die. But Hidetaka Miyazaki assumed this and thought this is probably too much. And in the game, there is an opportunity to treat NPCs thanks to healing amulets and dragon blood droplets, which by the way, are also not so easy to get. Of course, none of the players were ready for this, and of course the whole Twitter website was drowning in tears of players who had just come out of Dark Souls with the familiar mechanics of hitting enemies. It was so difficult that you had to constantly catch clear timings, or hope miraculously you were not killed by some one-shot, but you had the opportunity to roll or parry a blow thanks to the shield, Buckler. Moreover, you could pump your character for protection or strength and put on as much armor and shields as possible and feel like you were a tank. And now in Sekiro, a completely different mechanic awaited these players. Instead of rolls, there was the dodge mechanic, and the system of inflicting damage on the opponent's health also changed. The combat system became focused on using a katana or other available weapons to break the enemy's concentration. However, this does not mean that the health level has lost its significance. A completely healthy opponent can easily regain their concentration. That is, these two scales are interconnected, if it is not kept under constant pressure. Another new feature for players in the game was the presence of simple stealth mechanics that allow you to deal a fatal blow to enemies by stealthily sneaking up on them. Otherwise, to deliver such a blow, you would need to reduce the concentration scale mentioned above to zero. The player can see the alertness scale above the opponent's head, which appears if you get into their vision. Also, an important component of the gameplay are various tools that are built into the prosthesis of the main character's left hand. There's a grappling hook, a loaded shuriken, a loaded spear, which can help in combat and reconnaissance. In the end, Sekiro's Shadows Die Twice was not something new in terms of its punishment mechanics for a large number of deaths. All the tears shed by gamers were not very justified, because the Demon Souls series, which spawned all subsequent parts of the Dark Souls series, also punished reckless players for death by simply increasing the enemy's difficulty. And if you thought that such cruelty to players from developers existed only in the game series under the leadership of Hidetaka Miyazaki, then you are wrong. Another game, The Nightmare of Draga, under the leadership of Japanese companies Arika, Matrix Software, and Chunsoft, was released in 2004 on the PlayStation 2 and became the fourth best-selling game in Japan. So, does anyone else doubt that the Japanese are masochists? The fact is that this game became famous thanks to the relentless death mechanics, and also because it was a very high-quality, turn-based, roguelike game at the time. The gameplay of The Nightmare of Draga mainly consists of two types of gameplay, the city section and the dungeon section. In cities, you can move freely, buy items, improve equipment, perform side tasks, and also talk to the city inhabitants. They will offer useful information and some of them will guide the player to side dungeons. The plot, of course, as for all roguelikes, progresses by defeating the bosses at the end of each dungeon under the temple. Also common for this genre is the equipment mechanics system. Weapons and armor change the hero's speed relative to the enemies in the dungeon, as well as the range of his attacks, allowing for strategies in the armor selection. If you think that a game from 2004 could be so difficult, then brace yourself. Death in this, at first glance, trivial game leads to the loss of all accumulated gold and armor. Yes, this is no longer news, this is also found in the Dark Souls series, but entering a dungeon in fear of danger as an ordinary player of that time, you would probably want to press the autosave button like it happens in Skyrim. But the Nightmare of Draga will not allow you to return to a save point after death, because you know what? The game autosaves after you die, and this cannot be avoided. Whatever methods you use to do it, even turning off the console before death won't help. And furthermore, you'll listen to a monologue from the NPC that autosaving and swindling are the work of weak-minded heroes. And indeed, even now, every player would be shocked that the game breaks the fourth wall and speaks directly to them, challenging them to honestly conquer the dark dungeons and rescue Princess Key. The list of games that use death as a test will end with a rather unremarkable game in the survival horror genre. Zombie U from the Ubisoft company. 
It'll probably be stupid to compare Zombie U with such titans as Left 4 Dead or Dead Island or any game related to The Living Dead, because the game is frankly not very good. There was a large number of bugs, an undeveloped plot, or rather, none at all, monotonous gameplay, and it was released in 2012 when there were already games much better than Zombie U. But still, it found its place in our list of interesting death mechanics. In Zombie U, the entire gameplay is based on the fact that you play as a lucky person who managed to survive in London inhabited by zombies. The hero, giving quests, is controlled by some guy who sits in front of monitors connected to video surveillance cameras scattered around the city. And that's all. Of course, you're looking for quality supplies, weapons, and necessary syringes to save yourself. But that's all. The entire gameplay is based on the fact that the main character just runs and performs linear tasks. Of course, the first hours of the game you'll be afraid of kamikaze zombies, which will appear in every narrow corridor in a very gloomy scenery and any rustling, but then you'll get used to it and monotonous survival will begin. So in addition to all the game problems, Ubisoft decided to experiment and implement an interesting development system in Zombie U. Your hero starts with absolute zero. You level up, collect everything you need in your backpack, and if you die, you actually say goodbye to your character, accumulated experience, and resources. Another lucky guy, also a complete newbie, takes their place, and you have to start all over again. But the only thing that saves this mechanic is the ability to collect your belongings returning to the place of death and find your past character there in the form of an undead rebel. After killing it, you can take all your accumulated loot. All this may sound rather sad, but when the game was released on the console Wii U, players had a lot of time to get used to the gameplay and controls, and death caught up with gamers time and time again. Only after its adaptation to PC, Xbox, and PlayStation, it lost its complexity and charm, turning, as sad as it sounds, into an ordinary survival where the only thing to do is to survive. In general, the death mechanics as a test can also be called death as a challenge, because as you notice, the games just mentioned do not shy away from challenging and provoking players to take risks. Oh yes, some developers just love to flirt with death. However, not every game should burden you with death, penalize you, and make you spend a lot of time to complete. There are also more pleasant mechanics for the player, such as death as an opportunity, or death as a narrative tool, but we'll talk about them in the second part of our story. Therefore, if you want to know how games combine death and immortality at the same time, or how the developers of Bioshock Infinite wove death into the very game plot, then be sure to write us about it in the comments and support the release of the second part by liking this video and subscribing to our channel. The more likes we have for this video, the faster the second part will be released, which is almost ready. And that's all for today. Thank you for watching this video to the end. It was Press X. Bye bye.